On today's Locked on Jayhawks, early thoughts through the offseason for KU basketball in 2024 to 2025. Is this what it's going to be? What's most important? We'll play uh, some fun games of who cares and whose stat line is it anyway. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. You can give me a follow on Twitter at DJohnsonRadio. He's Nick Schwert at Nick underscore Schwert. And you can find us here with Locked on Jayhawks anywhere you get your podcast. Thank you for making it your first listen every day. We're free and available anywhere you get it, including on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. We're going to be talking about KU basketball offseason, looking ahead to 2024, 2025. And we got a, a fun segment in the middle portion of things here and we'll finish up with whose stat line is it anyway first though today's episode of the show is brought to you by game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on college for twenty dollars off your first purchase with game time so ku basketball finishes out the season second round exit to gonzaga since then we have seen riley kugel added to the team we've seen zeke mayo added to the team uh still waiting on some decisions to kind of come out And, and i'm curious your thoughts because as you know, there is a lot going around. It's it basically like a, a civil war among KU fans of, oh, this team wasn't very good, and now you're you're possibly bringing back, you know, if Furphy and Dickinson decide to come back. So you have a team that wasn't very good, and you're just going to run it back. But then you have the other side of it, which is, yeah, but Bill Self does really good when he has a lot of continuity, and the last time they brought back four starters, they won the national title. Where do you kind of stand as you prepare to get hit with a cannonball from the uh, other side of the the fan base? I would say I'm probably somewhere in the middle, but if I had to side mm. with one faction or the other, because I feel like I have to, I can't just yeah. say both. You have great points on both sides. I would say that I'm a little bit more towards the bringing people back. Like I want to see some continuity, but to me it comes with a caveat. I think when you go back to the beginning of this last season, there were a lot of points where we said, man, Hunter Dickinson may be the best big man in the country or looking like one of the best big men. Kevin McCuller played like an All-American. Johnny Furphy hits the ground running, looked like one of the best freshmen in the country. The pieces were there. They just didn't fit very well with one another. So are any of these guys that we're talking about potentially returning, including Dewan, KJ Adams, going to turn into significantly different players, not necessarily better, just different players than they were last year. Probably not. Duan is who he is. Hunter is who he is. Furphy can get better, but like we know what he is. He's a floor spacer. He's a transition finisher. I, I think what, what needs to happen if all of these guys end up returning is the roles just have to change a little bit. And when I say these guys, I'll, let's just get pointed with it. It's KJ Adams. Um, I, I would venture a guess to say that Bill Self, KJ Adams, both saw how that season went. Neither one of them are dumb. Neither one of them are like, yeah, let's just try it again. Yeah, no, no, it's, it'll work. We can put KJ next to Hunter for 30 minutes a night. That can work. It can't work. Anybody who watched Kansas this year knows that will not work. I would venture a guess to say when they do their exit meetings, probably last week or two weeks ago, there was maybe a little bit of a heart to heart to say, KJ, obviously, you know, this didn't work. We want you back. You're a program guy. We want you around the building. Like we want you on this team. Hey, you can't, you can't start next to Hunter Dickinson anymore. You can't play 30 minutes next to that guy anymore. So I think KJ can be a useful piece, just not the way they used him last year. And if you change up some of the pieces in just very, very subtle ways, right? Put a few more shooters on the floor in between Juan and Hunter, all of a sudden, I can envision how this would be a very good team with all the same pieces. Granted, they're not all playing the exact same role they played the year before. Yeah, and I, I do think it's interesting because I, I kind of run into that same thing where I'm like, well, you can't really fix the fit. Like, yes, you can make KJ come off the bench. You can make him play 22 minutes per game instead of 30. You can make Hunter Dickinson play 26 a game. You can make Dewan play 28 to 30 a game where he can be, you know, more rested, better defender. You can't really fix the fit. But then I think back to 2021 and what was the big offseason comment from Bill Self before that 2022 season? It was, or, or I guess right after the 2021 season ended, we need to get more athletic. 
and they brought everybody back. Like, it's not like they were way more athletic the next year. You know, they, they just were more experienced and they just were better. And Ochag Baji blossomed into a national player of the year candidate. And Remy Martin was enough in the postseason. And like that confluence of everything was, was enough to come together. So yeah, I, I think it is something where, you know, if you were asking me to build a roster, I would never want to start in today's day and age with two big men, but you know, you're, you're in a situation where you, where you're Kansas, where you have a second team All American at center who's putting up gigantic numbers, and you have a program guy in KJ Adams. You're you're not going to say no to either of those players coming back. To where you just have to kind of work with it and finesse it any way you can. And so uh, from that point, yeah, I think it is doable. And and who's to say that? Because I agree with you. I I do think that's probably something that Bill Self talked about in you know the exit meetings and that. You know, we'll see what the role ends up being. Maybe it ends up being, hey, we we do play a little bit of, of too big basketball if you're Bill Self, but it's it's 10 minutes a game. It's 15 minutes a game as opposed to all 40, and maybe it's not in a closing lineup or something like that. Um, but I, I do think there is a, a part of me that goes, you know, yes, it still is not ideal to play too big basketball, but, like, who's to say if Nick Timberlake wouldn't have just been a 40% three-point shooter, which is what you brought him in to be all season long, and if El Marco Jackson was, you know, looked like the potential first round draft pick that mock drafts had him before the season started, like maybe it would have worked anyway, even with the two big lineups, even if it wasn't a perfect fit, maybe they would have been a two seed or something in the NCAA tournament. Maybe they would have, you know, finished second or third in the big 12. Maybe they would have had a much better year where this wouldn't be as much of a, I guess, splitting hairs conversation. Yeah, when you have a lot of warts, you notice all of the individual ones more than you would if you just had a couple. Right. Like you, you magnify them. You say, look at all of these different issues. I think you're totally right. And especially this season where we kept waiting for things to start clicking. We kept waiting for one of these two guards to sort of emerge off the bench. We looked for the depth. We looked for the shooting and it never really happened. And then the conversation kind of changed a little bit, didn't it? It started to become, well, Hunter's pretty slow. Oh, he's not a great defender. Well, KJ's a bit of a liability. Well, Juan's not shooting enough. It's like, wait, are these actually the issue? Is this the main reason why KU's having the struggles they are this season? Or have we kind of just moved on because we got tired of saying the same thing for two or three months? So I'm with you. I think, is it perfect? No. But if you're telling me that's a 10-minute a lineup per game, like, no, there's not a team in the country, including UConn, who just won the national title, who just can look at their, their rotations from the beginning of the season and say, we're perfect for 40 minutes every single night. Like there, there are no shortcomings from any of the lineups that we could possibly, that's just going to happen. And if you told me that the biggest issue for KU next year is going to be that KJ is playing with Hunter for 10 minutes a game, I'll take that all day. What to you becomes the most important part of this off season. Now, as of right now, they're flush on scholarships. So we'll wait and see, I guess they could have the one more if they just pushed it down uh, another year, but you know, they're adding Zeke Mayo and, and Riley Kugel. I mean, you, you can never have enough shooting. Then again, we saw some of the defensive issues at the end of last season. What becomes, if, if you're going to add, say, one more player, and I don't know, it end up, might end up being more, might end up being less. What do you think is more important for the profile you're looking for? Perimeter shooting uh, slash creation or capable defender? Buckets all okay. day, all day. Because the thing with Timberlake, we knew he was a liability on defense, but we were like, he'll make up for it with his shooting. It'll be kind of like a double-edged sword for Bill Self. He loves defenders, but when the guy's knocking down 40% all season, you have no choice. Well, neither, I mean, he was a bad defender, and he made up for it by shooting 20% from three. So, like, I think that the defense had its issues, and Hunter's not super quick, whatever. I think that when you look at the, the problems from last year, if KU could just score the damn ball, we wouldn't have been talking about the defense. The metrics, I think, were pretty solid still. I think Kim Baum had him around a top 10 defense, but it was pretty obvious to anybody who was watching, like, this isn't great. Furphy wasn't great on defense. And then you start to wonder, are Dewan and Kevin, who we thought were elite defenders, are they maybe a little overextended, fatigued from just what they were having to take on all season long? So it, it's not going to be a perfect defense, I think, when Hunter is your anchor, but it could be good enough. I mean... That Michigan team, his freshman year, was really solid yeah. defensively, and they were two points away from going to the Final Four. I want to say Hunter's last year at Michigan, when the team wasn't even that great, um, a lot 
of people thought they had a bad defense. I think in Big Ten only games, they were like second in the Big Ten in defense. So uh, being big, being 7-2 still does matter. It's bad against ball screens. It's bad against teams who space the floor and everything. But like, I don't know, being giant uh, kind of does help. Yeah, you know? and, and let's just one final note on that. Like, it was a mess this year, Derek. It was a mess. And when you get to the end of the season and you've got the same issues you had at the beginning of the season, I'm not saying guys checked out. But it certainly felt like to us on the outside, the writing was on the wall. Then you hear Bill Self's comments. I've kind of been thinking about next year. Don't think he was checked out. But everybody recognizes what's happening. And so I just kind of wonder, like, was that maybe resignation a little bit that this just isn't going to happen? There was no digging deep. There were no dogs who were getting these guys to, like, find that extra gear to get to the finish line. So I'm not going to read too much into it. The biggest problem all season was shooting scoring, playmaking. That's what I'm going with. All right, we're going to debut a uh, new segment coming up next. It's called Who Cares? You're going to say what you care more about. I'm going to give you two options, and we'll go back and forth on that on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 bucks. Win or lose, bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win. You can bet on the Masters this week as well. Who's going to win? Uh, you can round one leader. You can have all sorts of fun with it. Customize any way you want. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook and official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Network. Okay, so uh, this is a new segment called Who Cares? And I'm going to give you two options. You tell me which one you care more about. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't care about the other one, or maybe you don't care about either, but you have to pick one between the two. Zeke Mayo committing or Riley Kugel committing? Which do you care more? I care more about Zeke Mayo. Um, And I'm biased. You know this. Like I covered all his games in high school. And by the time he was a freshman, 15 year old starting for one of the best teams in the state of Kansas, I said, that kid is different. Like basketball IQ in control. And then you see it translate to the next level, being one of the best players in his conference for each of the last two years. I don't think he's going to be a star at Kansas, but going back to what KU needs. First off, he's the antithesis of Nick Timberlake, like dribbling off your knee, like trying to yam it and it going two feet into the state. Like that's not Zeke. He's going to be in control. He's not going to be hunting shots. He is just going to like take what is given to him. I think that's a perfect compliment next to Juan. Like I'll I'll say it right now, April 9th, I think Zeke Mayo is going to be the starting two guard Mm -hmm. for Kansas. I think he could be a 10, 11, 12 point per game score, knock down 40% of your threes. Like, this is going to be a really good secondary ball handler with Kugel. I I just don't know enough. I think all these guys are probably told the same thing by the staff, which is, Hey, not going to promise you a starting spot. What we will promise you is a chance to compete, right? There's going to be a ton of roster overturn. We're looking to shake things up. We're looking to really change the fabric of this team from last season to next season. You can be a part of that. So with Kugel, he's a wing. He had a really good fresh into his freshman year. Uh, lost his starting job, didn't really respond well. So I really don't know what to make of him, but he seems to me like to be like a high upside type guy who certainly can score in bunches. So I think they're both good ads and they both kind of fit the mold of what KU is trying to do this off season. But I'm going Zeke just because I feel like I know what he's going to bring to this team. I would agree. Uh, it's Zeke, but yeah, I think there's a little uh, internal bias from, from me. For sure, personally. for sure. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, it's it's the shot creation. I mean, Riley Kugel, it's the same idea, shot creation, good athlete. But with Zeke, there's a little bit more efficiency there. Okay, uh, Hunter Dickinson's decision, which we're waiting on, or Johnny Furphy's decision, which we're waiting on? Man, this is tough because I feel more confident that Hunter's going to return than I do Furphy. Try to remove that. Like, which do you think is more important for the team, I guess? I'm going to say Hunter. Okay. Because whether or not you think he's a better player, he changes how KU plays next year in a more substantial way. Like if Johnny's gone, okay, what what like what what is Johnny Furphy? He is a knockdown shooter and he's a transition finisher. All right, I mean you may not get as good of a version of that, 
but you can get that in the portal. What if Hunter's gone? Okay, well, now your bread and butter offensively is gone. You have to completely rewrite how you think this team plays. First off, you got to go get a starting center. Like you have to go, I don't know. And I don't know what kind of player that will be. Is or you have to steer into playing KJ at the five with, you know, Florida right. and stuff, right? It completely exactly. changes the way you want to play. Yeah. So if I'm just doing the roster math, set aside what you think about those guys. We know how KU is going to play with Hunter Dickinson out there. He is going to be the number one option offensively, and he's going to be an incredibly efficient scorer. He's going to get you 20 and 10 close to every single night. I don't know how you replicate that. And I don't know how you complete. I mean, Hunter's gone. You completely take a step back with what you're doing this off season and say, okay, we're shifting all of our priorities. We got to go figure out if we can get a starting big in the portal with Furphy. I just don't think it changes things that much. See, for me, I, I am still going Furphy just because like, who's the other true wing on this roster? Like KJ, I guess is sort of a wing if he's playing the four, but we know not really. And then uh, Riley Kugel, maybe he'll play some three, but like he's not really a wing. He's more of a guard. He's like the but one I think that's. Wing. But I think that's why, like, when you start to hear about some of these portal names that KU is reaching out to mm-hmm. and potentially interested in, I think that, uh, in in some ways, like, yeah, you might you might try to add those guys even if Furphy does come back. But in some ways, they can be seen as an insurance policy. Okay, yeah. Furphy's gone. Let's go get AJ Store from Wisconsin, right? Like, it's just. There are more of those out there. There are more wings out there than there are seven, two big men who can get you 20 a night. KJ Adams coming back for his final season or Dewan Harris coming back for his final season. What do I care more about? Mm-hmm. Um. Well, okay. So like I said earlier, I know there's a lot of fans out there and I may have even said this a month ago. Like I I may have thought differently about it. I know there's a lot of KU fans out there who are just like, no, Bill Self won't be able to quit KJ. Like, I don't care what anybody says. It's going to be game one, Allen Fieldhouse in November, and KJ is going to be starting playing 30 minutes. I don't think that's going to happen. So the KJ return to me doesn't signal that we're just running it back again with this same like core group of guys. So I'm going to answer one, and it's because... Juan is so interesting. Like he's he's such a good point guard, but I feel like the fact that he has a ring and he's like one of Bill's guys, like Bill made that very clear from day one. Hey, like this kid's special. He's gonna be really good. It it, it just hampers how you build a, a lineup, man. Like I love Juan, but I feel like he gets a little bit overinflated in like the value he brings to a team. And he's been here for it, what seems like six years already, but I mean, it really will be a sixth year with the team f- fifth year playing. And I oh God, this is going to be hard for me to like say out loud, but um, there's part of me. That's just like, it's time. Like, thank you. Thank you for hey title. You're a legend. You'll always be a legend, but like, maybe it's, maybe it's time to get some fresh blood in that uh, starting point guard spot. But I think aside from what you think about him, just how he plays, it's it's probably a little bit tougher to like recruit these elite point guards in or even two guards because most of these two guards are used to having the ball in their hands. Like most of these guys want the ball and they don't play well without it. See Nicholas Timberlake. What happened when you took the ball out of his hands? Like it didn't look pretty because he's like, I'm a spot up shooter. Well, then I'm just going to shoot every single time I touch the ball. So I, I think it affects the team in a more substantial way with KJ coming back. I don't think it guarantees anything. Juan's coming back. Obviously like where else is he going to go? You know what his role is going to be. Like he is going to be your starting point guard and he's going to play 35 minutes a night. You can go ahead and set that in stone. For me, I'm leaning KJ just because of it. I mean, the role is so undefined. What What is the role going to be? How is this team going to play? I think it's interesting. I, I also think it's very interesting. This doesn't just go for Dewan and KJ. I guess technically it would go for you know Hunter Dickinson if he came back. Uh, we've seen the last three years, a KU player who decided to use that one final year to come back to Kansas, and they've had a big jump. And, and we've seen it before, even past the last three years, right? You saw it with Frank Mason, um, I guess to like, like a lesser extent, you could say you saw it a little bit with like Perry Ellis and um, I don't know, some other guys that, that you could mention there. 
does that happen for any of those players? With like Hunter Dickinson, it feels like you're kind of already at the ceiling. With Dewan Harris, it feels like we know what you're getting with Dewan, but is there another level with KJ? You know what I mean? Like, yo, but, yo, but you know what though? We say this a lot, like at basketball, yeah. people like people who you know, criticize the game or whatever, talk about the game. We use that phrase a lot. Like, oh, he kind of is who he is. No, I remember me and you had a lot of conversations saying just that about Frank Mason going into a senior year. Yeah, of and, course. And then what happened? And it is overused. Like you think you see a guy for three years and you're and he's 22 and you're just like, oh, he'll never change. Um, I feel pretty confident saying Dewan Harris is the most is who he is player that may have ever existed. And only because we've seen him for so long and it's never he's he plays the exact same way he did his freshman year four years ago. And we've been waiting every offseason. Maybe he'll just get on that jumper just a little bit or just be a little more eager to shoot. It's never, it's never changed. And that's fine because I will still maintain if you have Dewan Harris at the one and Hunter at the five, it can work really, really well. You just need three shooters in between them. And not like three shooters like Kevin McCuller was a shooter mm -hmm. this year. No, like three pure knockdown shooters in between them. Like that's a national championship starting five. All right, let's finish up whose stat line is anyway on Locked on Jayhawks. First, this episode of the show is brought to you by Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events should not be stressful. Game Time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They have killer last-minute deals on tickets, and their best price guarantee means you can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you can be having. You can get tickets for uh, a bunch of baseball games going on right now. You know, Sometimes that's just easier. You decide on a Wednesday night, hey, you know what? Tickets look pretty cheap on the Game Time app. You can buy them last minute. You can see the images of your seat view so you know exactly what you're signing up for. And then you just purchase them and go have fun at the game. Don't be stressed. Have fun. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We're gonna finish up with whose stat line is it anyway. I only have one for you today, um, but I think it's an interesting one. So. Johnny Furphy led Kansas this past season. Do you know? I, I mean, I don't know if you want to guess this with how many made threes. Oh, gosh. I don't know. He, um, 60? 44. So okay. not a very large number, obviously, right? So 44 made threes. That led Kansas this year uh, in terms of volume. So if we go back two years ago to the team that won the national title, how many players on that team do you think made more than 44 three-pointers in that season? Okay, um, at least two, Ochai and CB, I'm guessing. Ochai made, made 103. Christian Brown did clear it. He had 51. I think that's it because Remy didn't play enough. Jalen was not a good shooter. Dewan Jaylen didn't shoot 30. enough. Remy had 29, Jalen Coleman lands had 30. So yeah, the answer is two there, which I found to be a little bit surprising. And I was actually going back and looking, obviously there've been a lot of people who have made the comps with the 2021 team to this team. And, and I think part of that comes from the hope of what would happen after that. But it's actually funny. Kansas finished after the national title game the other night, Kansas finished this year, 27th in Ken Palm, the 2021 team finished 27th in Ken Palm. The 2021 team ended up shooting 33.6% from three. This year's team shot 33.6% from three. And so when we look at the national title team the next year, well, they clearly shot threes a lot better. The number went up to 36.1%, which didn't put them like in an elite category in the country, but it put average. them at, exactly, put them in a, at a good enough range where when you combine everything else, it was enough. And, and when you look at it, you might be wondering, okay, what led to that jump in the number? Obviously, they had Remy Martin instead of Marcus Garrett, but Remy Martin are only made six more threes than Marcus Garrett did on 4% better. So it's not all that. Jalen Wilson got worse by a decent amount uh, freshman to sophomore year. So that actually went down. Christian Brown went up a little bit. There was really one reason why they became a much better three-point shooting team. And it was one guy. It was Ochai Agbaji. Ochai shot 41% on 243 tries. The rest of Kansas 
shot 32.4% from three that year on 432 tries. Ochai made 103 three-pointers. The rest of the team combined made 140. So I don't know if this is a a smart thing to rely on. Maybe this is more of like the exception to the rule and, and this shouldn't be a lesson that I'm trying to come through. But here's what I'm basically saying. Is it as simple as for KU to take a big jump shooting the basketball, just having one guy who can go bonkers, i.e. a Johnny Furphy coming back? I don't think it is because, well, I would first say about that 2022 team and specifically relating to the jump from 2021. For the longest time, when when Bill only had one title at Kansas, we would always hark back to the 08 team. You know, that team had, that team had, that team was actually the best team in the country, like all season. They were one of the best teams in the country. I think they were the number one overall seed entering the tournament. Uh, they were the fourth, actually. Okay, enough. well, close. I know it was only three off. That was obviously um, a bonkers year. with. Yeah, and all four of those one seeds made the mm. final four. The 2022 team, I don't think we should use in that way because from the sheer standpoint of Bill Self is never going to look back on that team and say, let's do that. Like, let's let's get a guy in who's supposed to be like our starting point guard who there's drama surrounding all season long, goes through knee injuries, and then just like shows up in March and helps lead us to a title. Uh, I think back to that year, all the conversation and narratives around David McCormick, like, is he good enough to get the job done? And like, he was never really that dude until it mattered. And I'm not trying to take away from that team. I'm just saying, I don't think that's the blueprint. I don't think that 2022 team should ever be the blueprint only because I don't know how repeatable it is. I don't know how much of that team you would say, no, that's the formula. That's the way to get it done. I think there are better ways to get it done or more likely ways because Ochai, I mean, that dude was different. Like that off season working out with Damian Lillard's trainer, like took his game to a completely different level. I don't think I could put those expectations on Furphy. I I get it. Like he was, he's already an NBA draft prospect and Ochai wasn't, but that's, that's a lot to ask of a kid who's supposed to be a senior in high school right now. So it sounds great, by the way, I just want to say that I'd love it if Furphy came back and played like a first team all American and was a 40, whatever percent, three point shooter average in 20 a game, sign me up. I don't think that like, if I'm trying to figure out how KU gets to that level next year, that that's the way I'm going to do it. I, I do think that as much as I'm an advocate for keeping guys in the program, developing them, this team is in need of of a talent infusion that I think you have to do through the portal. He's Nick Schwert. Uh, what can you check out with some of your work going on right now? Uh, we'll have a podcast up later this week. Could be wrong. You can check it out on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. All right. You can give him a follow at Nick underscore Schwert. Give me a follow at D Johnson Radio. That'll do it for today's episode of Locked on Jayhawks. Find us anywhere you get your podcasts and on our YouTube page. See you next time with LOJ.